All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming for this last talk on this conference. Um, uh, I think it's time to start. So my name is Krzysztof Czerywa. I'm a senior software engineer at Intel. Uh, for the last over two, over two years, um, I've been working on persistent memory programming, uh, particularly uh, NVML, a non-volatile memory library implementation. And uh, I prepared this presentation together with Tomasz. Uh, you could chance uh, uh, listen to this, his talk about the uh, uh, leap uh, C++, leap uh, C++ uh, extensions for persistent memory. And uh, I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, the, the tool we created uh, as a, some side work of um, our NVML development, uh, the, the tool that uh, would uh, help you to detect errors, uh, um, specifically uh, persistent memory errors. Um, so, uh, as usual, for all those persistent memory talks, we start with uh, persistent memory programming model. So, you have seen this slide probably a couple of times today. <clears throat> uh, so, the most important uh, part is on the right side, and uh, uh, as you know, we built our libraries on top of uh, SNIA and VM programming model, which is actually based on memory map files, and the uh, essential part of this model is some PMEM aware file system. So in practice, this is some file system which has a so-called DAX uh, feature enabled. Could be perceived as a kind of RAM disk uh, that runs on top of persistent memory. It's aware of that. So if you map a file that is stored on this um, file system, uh, there is no page cache and you have this direct low and store access to, to, to memory. So uh, this is interesting model because, you know, persistent memory is a new tier uh, of, of memory, of storage. This is lays something between the DRAM and, and storage, actually. So uh, in, some, in some aspects, we could treat it as a, it's more convenient to treat it as a storage. And, and, uh, in some other, uh, it's better, it's more convenient to treat it as, as memory, actually. So, so this is like a sort of uh, wave particle duality of light. <laughs> so this part addresses the, the issue with, you know, uh, how to locate your data in persistent memory. You don't need to remember where it is located, where, what is the physical address of, of your data. Uh, you can just use the you know, path names to to find your 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 data, uh, which is which is stored in persistent memory. You can also uh, manage the uh, access permissions and so on. But once you uh, map it to uh, map the file to memory, uh, you can have a direct access. So from this point on, this is just a, behaves like a regular DRAM, more or less. But still, you need some software to, uh, let's say, when you map the file, you have some big bunch of, big block of persistent memory. You need some software to, to carve this, this bl block, this region of memory into some smaller objects, and uh, also to do some stuff to actually flash the data to persistent, because uh, it, it's not so simple as it looks like. Uh, we talked about it on the previous presentations, so uh, I will talk about it on the next slides. So, yeah, the persistent memory programming is all about face safety. I like this, this because this is all true. I have found it on some presentation, I, but I don't remember who was the author. I believe someone from Red Hat or maybe HP. Anyway, but this is, this is all true. Um, and why is it true? Uh, so, some people naively think that when you store the data to persistent memory, it's already there. It's already durable. It's not. Actually, this is, this is the long way the data needs to pass through to get to the so-called persistent domain. So, uh, 
when you store the data, when you do some move instruction, store instruction, uh, and you want to make this data to reach the, the DIM, actually you need to flush all these caches, caches, CPU caches, and also the, uh, the memory controller uh, write queues buffers. So you can do it uh, in a couple of ways. So for the CPU caches, you can use the CL flash instructions. It's available for a long time. Uh, it flashes the given cache line. Uh, but uh, recently, we added the new instructions, which is a CL flash op, the optimized uh, CL flash, also uh, cache line write back. So this is the instruction that flashes the given uh, cache line, but doesn't invalidate it. So the data is still there if you uh, would like to read the data soon. Uh, the other option is if you like to bypass this entire path, you can use the non-temporal stores. So, so it, the data would go directly to here. And uh, also there is a write back invalidate instruction, uh, which invalidates uh, all the caches, uh, which is uh, you know heavy one, and probably you don't want to use it. Uh, it's, you can use it actually only in the kernel space. And originally, when we started the NVML development, uh, the persistent domain was this smaller red box. So uh, to make the data persistent, you also uh, had to flush the right pending queues of the memory controller. So the, the example code would look like this. You do some stores, you flush the, the specific cache lines where this data resides, then you need to put some memory fence to make sure that those instructions are really executed. Uh, you don't need to do it with CL flash because this is strong order, but those two are weakly ordered, so the fence is, is really required. And then once you did that, you had to issue the pcommit instruction to flash this, drain these memory controller buffers, and then it also had to be followed by a, a memory fence instruction. But recently, uh, Intel, and together with uh, some other companies, decided that if you want to use a non-volatile memory on your platform, you actually need to support ADR. Actually, the, your platform needs to have, uh, be equipped with ADR, uh, asynchronous zero refresh feature. So uh, because of that, the persistent domain becomes bigger. So if there is a power failure, actually this, um, these pending queues will be flashed by the hardware. So you don't need to do it in explicitly in your software. So now this is this, the deprecated way how we, how we uh, flush the data to, persistent and to persistence, and here is the, the new way. So the pcommit has gone, which is fine because it's also the heavy instruction and, and uh, kind of problematic. Uh, okay. What other, so, so the flashing data to, to persistence is one of the, the problems. You need to remember it, so it's not just like store and, and forget. The other problem is that this eight byte atomicity uh, stores. So if you're crossing the eight bytes, uh, when you're going to write more than, more than eight bytes, uh, uh, the, you know, if, and this, uh, this operation is torn by some power failure or application failure, before it gets flushed, then the result could be any of that. And actually, the first one is, is OK. You can still see the old data or an initial buffer. And the last one is also OK. <laughs> so you were lucky, and the data gets flushed actually by, uh, you know, because of the cache pressure, the data has been flushed to, uh, to Deem uh, without actually reaching this code. But those are probably not what you expected. And OK, what if we have the instruction that could atomically store 64 bytes or more? OK, that would be better because, you know, maybe in some cases it would help. You can do some more atomic operations in, uh, using single instruction. But still, <laughs> then if you have a, a chunk of data which is larger than 64 or whatever, then you still could reach this issue. Uh, 
So yes, and this is the example with string copy, but actually there could be uh, like multiple stores here. And you never know what happens when, you know, all these stores are executed, but not flushed yet. So, you know, the first problem is that the compiler could reorder these instructions, which is perfectly legal if you don't put the explicit memory barriers here. Also, the CPU can reorder the stores, which is something that you actually, it's hard to control. And so when you do some uh, multiple stores, you need to care about, you know, uh, whether you need all those stores to, uh, to happen like all or nothing, like you, you want to make this, uh, all the changes atomic or, or not. So to solve this problem, we probably need some sort of uh, transactions. So this is something that uh, Tom was talking about on the previous talk. All right, so we have as Tom said, the presentation should be storytelling, so maybe some short story. So when we started this NVML implementation, uh, uh, at some point we find out that huh, we probably need some tool to test our library to make sure that it actually does all this stuff correctly. Because the people that would use our library, they you know, rely on, on us and they, they would expect that that if they use our library, they, they are safe, they, they data is safe. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is some sort of problems that are hard to, to actually test uh, in software because as I said, there are some, some things that happen in hardware. So you can, it's hard to, to design the test that would simulate those conditions. So, uh, we decided maybe we should write some tool that would analyze the code, either the source code, some static code analysis, or maybe the binary code, to detect the problems like missing stores, or maybe some, uh, uh, I'm sorry, missing flashes. So you do the store, but you don't flash it to persistent correctly, uh, as, the, as on the previous slide. Uh, also, there could be some performance issues like you do the store, you do the flash, and you do the flash, and you do the flash. So you do some unnecessary flashes, but they are not for free. They, they would affect the performance. And, uh, and also, you know, some, some other problems, perhaps. So uh, we were thinking about, you know, writing some tools from, from scratch, but uh, eventually we decided to use Valgrind, but uh, let's start with some, let's say, requirements we had for this, for this utility. So first of, first of all, we, uh, this tool had to um, recognize which memory is persistent, which is not. Because only for persistent memory, all those uh, uh, flashing and, and, and transactions applies. Uh, also, as I said, the, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so this uh, detection of uh, the stores that were not flashed that detects the stores that you know you store, you don't flash, and you store the new data to the same location. Probably there's something wrong with your program, and also detect some unnecessary flashes, and probably to do some support for transactions that uh, <clears throat> I will talk about on the next slide. Next slides. Uh, the last feature. Probably the most interesting is something that could allow us to simulate the things that happen in the CPU. Like, you know, reordering the, the flashes, like, you know, because of the CPU uh, cache pressure, some, you know, the later store could actually be flashed before the earlier store, right? This actually may happen, so, so uh, you, need to, uh, you need to care about it. So we have a couple of examples, uh, like, what the tool could detect, like here we have a store and another store to another location, and we have a yet another store to the same location, but there was no flash between. Uh, so this is, this is probably something wrong here. Here we have some unnecessary flashes, so, you know, double flash or the flash of the location that was not actually modified at all. And also here is the interesting problem, like uh, this is about this uh, 
flash reordering. So, so here we have three stores to different locations and three flashes. So it looks like somebody did some couple of modifications and he wants to uh, that all of them are flash at the same time, like they want to, those stores to be atomic. Uh, but in practice, if if this is torn here, uh, there is some power failure crash here before those flashes are executed. We don't know what is what is actually the the result in the memory. It could be that this is actually executed, or this is, or or nothing. Uh, and if, like in this, we can see that these are actually the actual data, and this is like a completion flag. So you want to implement some sort of simple transaction by your own. So you store your data and then you set the flag, okay, this is done. So you can recover when the operation is torn, then after reboot you can find, okay, the flag is not set, so discard the data. But in practice, as I said, the order of, of those flashes could be changed. Uh, so you never know whether this, this flag would be actually set and those data are not. So the correct order could be look like this. So we store the data, flash the data, then we store the, the flag and flash the flag. So, so we are missing uh, fences here, but this is just a simple example. Okay, so uh, as I said, we thought about the, maybe writing some new tool, but uh, because we also uh, the part of NVML of libpmm opt is also the persistent memory allocator. We also did some instrumentation for uh, a memcheck tool, which is also a, a tool written on, on top of Valgrind framework. So, because we did that, uh, we also uh, uh, had some experience how Valgrind works, uh, how it detects that the memory was stored, and how it detects that the store was uh, uh, how, uh, you know, um, that you make a store to some memory that was already freed and stuff like that. So we thought, okay, so Valgreen does a lot, of, uh, a lot of work we actually need. So it tracks all the changes to the memory, all the accesses to memory. So we only need to teach him how to, you know, uh, 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 how to detect whether the you know the order of operations is correct. So maybe a simple question: How many of you have ever used Valgrind? All of you, almost all of you. That's what I was expecting. But how many of you actually did the I don't know read the code? How or did the take a look at the source code of Valgrind to understand how it works? Okay, two guys, good. So. This is a very smart creature, uh, Valgrind, and it. Um, uh, so this is the binary instrumentation framework. So it. Um, um, what is the nice? That is multi-platform. Uh, it and uh, on the next slide, I'll show you a simple example of how it works internally. So it actually, when you execute the code, this is dynamically deassembled to some and. Converted into some intermediate representation, this VEX IR, some some intermediate language, which is platform independent. Then it is this code is passed to the to the to the to, to your tool, which it could be memcheck, could be Helgrin, DRD, or pmemcheck. And then you could instrument this code by adding some you know call to, calls to some callbacks. You can register for some specific specific instructions, and then it is translated back to the machine code and stored in, in the cache. So this, this disassembly and uh, translation happens only once, only when this particular fragment of code is executed for the first time. This is nice. And uh, yeah, so, so then you can, you can detect, you know, for all those, in our case, we are interested in all the stores to memory and also these flash operations. So then we can implement some state machine in, in the PMM check to check whether those, those operations are performing the correct order. And that's basically it. 
Uh, yes, yet another nice feature of Valgrind is a client request mechanism, so, so you can inject some, some specific requests or uh, yeah, queries to, uh, in your code. Uh, actually, this is uh, very tricky because it's, this macro injects the, some magic assembly code, which does nothing. Actually, this is transparent. It's, it doesn't change the result of, the, of your program, but also it is not optimized out. So it's like cheating with the compiler to not optimize this code. So it's actually there. And the, your tool, Valgrind tool, actually uh, recognizes these magic sequences of code. And you know, it knows that, OK, that th this is the request for the application. So this is to you know, do some actions that could, couldn't be, uh, you know, that, you know, like, as I said, the Valgrind just uh, uh, recognizes some, some specific uh, assembly instructions and, and it converts it to, to, to some intermediate language. And, and uh, you know, in some cases, this is enough to, to do some actions. But uh, there are some actions that cannot be you know, detected based on, the, on some specific uh, sequence of instructions. So then you have to help the tool with your macros. And one of those um, examples is like uh, in PMEM check, we are telling the Valgrind, the PMEM check, which memory is actually persistent memory which is, and which is not. So uh, this is, and the other example, which will be also on the next slides, is like we inform the, the, the tool that we are starting the transaction and, or we are committing the transaction. Yeah, so if you want to write your own tool, it's, it's not rocket science, but also it's not trivial. Uh, there are some examples in the uh, Valgrind repository, so you need to implement uh, th those mandatory four functions. The names are actually, you can pick your own names. We, uh, you know, this is our, the names are just the pick the action, what, what this functions does, and PMC is just our prefix for PMM check. So the most important one is this instrument, which does, you know, handles all those intermediate uh, uh, representation event statements and does some actions to instrument the, uh, the final code. Uh, because we are handling these uh, client macros, we also, of course, have this handle client request uh, function as well and some command line arguments processing. All right, so what are the pros and cons for using Valgrind to build a new tool? Um, basically, the Valgrind is very feature-rich uh, framework, and uh, as I said, multi-platform. So we are, of course, we are Intel guys. We are focused on x86 architecture, but we believe that the same programming model, the SNIA programming model, could be used for other architectures. Perhaps the instructions to flash the cache uh, would be different, maybe not just one instruction, maybe a sequence of instructions, but the, the general idea is the same. And actually, the same tool could be used on other architectures because you know what's inside operates the the the, the, the core of the PMM check tool operates on this intermediate representation, which is the same for all all the architectures. And it's widely used, as we have seen. All of you have used Valgrind. So there is a big chance that if we write a new tool based on Varkin, it would be adopted by the community. Also, the multi-threading programs uh, are much easier to analyze using Varkin because it serializes all the, all the threads, which is good and bad, but, but it makes it easier. So the drawbacks are the, the API. <laughs> it's not very well documented. It takes... Uh, some time to went through the code to understand how it works. Uh, but this is actually our problem, not the user's problem, right? So the actual problem for us is the performance. So, you know, when you run your program under the, 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 the tool, um, it, of course, affects the performance. The, the execution is a, a couple of times slower. And uh, we also face this uh, one of... Uh, because of the design, how, how we implemented PMM check, we faced this uh, problem as well. 
So I will talk about it later. OK, so what is PMM check, actually? So as I said, this is a persistent memory error detection tool, which is focused specifically on persistent memory uh, programming issues. Uh, so as I said, this flashing to persistence, uh, also this um, flash reordering problems, and it also provides some support for basic support for transactions. If you, you know, it doesn't have, you don't have to use NVML, but if you implement your own persistent memory library, then probably you would like to, to implement also some sort of transactions, so PMMCheck would also support that. Uh, we built this tool, you know, having in mind the NVML and, and libpmm ops libraries, but we strive to make this tool pretty generic. So it could be used with any software that uses the same programming model. So, so you know, if you use NVML, you have it for free. You know, all the instrumentation is there, and you can build your application on top of NVML libraries, and, you know, you can run and test your program under, with PMMCheck. But if you decide to write your own software, okay, PMMCheck would also help you to, to detect errors in, in your programs. What PMM check is not? <laughs> this is not a generic error, memory error detector. So it's not designed to, to detect memory leaks, uh, double freeze, and stuff like that, or to access to uninitialized memory out of band, and you know, stuff like that. So for this purpose, you should use memcheck because this is designed for that. Actually, this is a tricky, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the memory leaks is, is, in case of persistent memory, this is a tricky part because, you know, if you allocate and you don't free bec before the program termination, this is perfectly fine because this is persistent memory. So, you know, you want the, these objects to persist until the next run of your program. So, this is perfectly okay. But a leak is actually the situation when you lose the reference to the object, right? So we probably could detect that. But the problem is it doesn't have to be a problem. It depends on the architecture of, your, of, your, of the design of your, of your program. So uh, for instance, in case of LPMM opt, uh, all the objects you allocate from uh, our LPMM opt persistent memory pool they're just, you know, there's a big container of objects. They're, they don't have to be, you know, referenced to each other. So we have a function or macros to iterate through all the objects. So even if you don't have a reference to, you know, to any of them, when you start your program, you can iterate through all of them and, you know, there are no orphaned, you know, or the objects that you cannot access, you cannot free. So you would have the persistent memory in, in such case. Uh, but also, we can imagine a situation that you have a structure like, uh, I don't know, tree or something, so each object refers to another object, so, so there should be no orphaned objects in the, in the pool. And um, also our library provides the, the feature like a root object, so, you know, whatever structure you have, or multiple structures, they all should be referenced from the root object, so this is the one object from which you can access any other in the pool. So in such case, if you have an object that is not referenced from anywhere, that this is a leak. But, uh, you know, as I said, it, it, it's not a must. You, know, you don't have to design your program that way. But also the problem is that, uh, as we could see on previous slides, it's what the, what the actually the persistent pointer is. And, you know, in NVML, we decided to, to implement it as a kind of structure which holds the, the pool identifier and the offset within the pool. But, you know, other implementers may implement the, the libraries, the allocators in some other way. So the persistent pointer would be something different. And PMMCheck is a generic tool. So, you know, unless we have a standard uh, definition, you know, of a persistent pointer, how it is, how should it be interpreted, what it actually is, then it is hard to implement this feature uh, in the tool. Uh, so we decided not to do it, at least yet. But who knows, maybe in the future. 
okay, so how it is implemented internally, uh, or actually how we did implementation of, of this PMM check. So the first thing we had to do was to the support for the new instructions. So this CL flash opt, CLWB, and P commit. So as I said, P commit has gone, it's deprecated, <laughs> but we started the implementation uh, two years ago, so uh, it was already there, so we implemented it. Uh, so I mentioned it only for educational, educational purposes, uh, and, but still, uh, we had to add the support. It's not a very complex task. Uh, you know, you can just do some copy and paste because you know there are some a lot of a lot of instructions. Uh, all of the actually ESA must be supported by by uh, uh, Valgrind, so so. Um, to add the new instruction, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, but also we had to differentiate a uh, few instructions like, you know, the intermediate representation of CL flash is just flash. But, you know, as I said, we have a strong or weakly ordered flash instructions now. So we need to know whether this flash requires fans after that or not. So we had to, you know, modify a uh, core part of, of Valgrind to, to support that. Also, the same problem was with uh, memory fences. So all the fence instructions, load fence, store fence, memory fence, they all translate to just to, to the same intermediate opcode. But, you know, the CL flash opt is ordered by store fence, but not, not the load fence, so we had to differentiate those. And we added the P commit support, but as I said, it's not, not necessary right now. Uh, yeah, and we also added this support for uh, uh, CRM uh, macros to, to tell the tool whether, when, when the memory is actually, uh, persistent memory is allocated. And uh, not only to tell which memory is persistent, but sometimes we want to, you know, uh, tell the tool that this is a big block of persistent memory, but this part is actually volatile because we store some runtime data there and don't treat it as, as a persistent memory, even though it's, you know, actually on top of NVDMs. Uh, we have at least two, uh, two examples in our libraries for this uh, um, situation. So, as I said, we do some uh, in the header of the pool, we store some runtime data. It's more convenient because you have all the metadata in one place, but some of them are not persistent. And the other examples are our PMEM logs. So um, maybe it's not the time to, to talk about it in, in detail, but these are sort of, sort of just regular mutexes, read, write logs. And we want to, you know, that the state of these logs, it resets. Uh, they are all reinitialized where, when, you, uh, when you open the pool the next time. So you have a, uh, uh, you make sure that all the locks are actually unlocked on the next open. Okay, some examples of those uh, um, client request macros. So, you know, oh, sorry. Okay, wrong button. So here are the macros to register persistent memory region or unregister. And uh, also we have those macros to inform the tool that you flash the data to persistence or you uh, drain the control buffers, memory control buffers. Uh, you may ask why we need this? Uh, the answer is because this is a generic tool. So if you have some other mechanism to flash the data or uh, drain the memory control buffers, there is no dedicated instruction for that. Then you can do some stuff and put the macro, uh, you know, I mean the other architectural, like, uh, for instance, so you, you can put the macro to inform the, the PMM check that you did the right thing, so, so it knows that the, you know, the flow is correct. Uh, yes. And, of course, if you're using NVML, you don't need any, our API, then you don't need to do any instrumentation in your code. Other macros for, for transactions, 
and for uh, some logging features. So I will tell about that on the next slides. So to to track the you know whether the flow of the data is you know correct, then we implemented some sort of uh, simple state machine where each uh, memory location, like a byte uh, of the persistent memory region, is could be in some four or five states. Uh, actually, because of this, again, because of this p commit deprecation, this stuff is gone. <laughs> it's not necessary here. So when you uh, do the flash and you do the fence, actually, it goes directly to the clean state. Uh, yes, and as I said, we track the, the state per byte. Uh, so someone may ask, why not per cache line? Because you know when you're flashing the the memory, it's always a full cache line. But you know, so when you do this, some a couple of store, like two stores to some to the same cache line, but to you know different bytes, and then you do the one flash, see a flash instruction. It may happen for the tool. It may happen. Okay, that was correct. You did the stores. You did the flash. So if we track the you know the only. In, with cache line granularity, it would be like the cache line was dirty, then it was flush, everything is fine. But, you know, maybe this is because the data is, you know, it's, uh, the location of the data by accident is within the, you know, both fields are in the same cache line. But if you know the alignment would be different, you would actually uh, touch two cache lines with those two straws, it would, and then it, you would need two flashes. So actually, it means that you are missing just one flash, and PMM check would detect that. So this is why we decided to track the, you know, the memory state per byte. Of course, if there is some big reg region of clean memory or some region of dirty, like uh, some continuous, contiguous region uh, of, of data, we don't keep the state for each and every byte. We, we keep the, you know, the, we have a tree of regions. But if you do like, if you do the store for each, you know, every uh, second byte, so you have a clean byte, dirty byte, clean byte, dirty byte, then of course the, the, would, you know, the tree would grow up rap rapidly and this is one of the, you know, performance issues we observe. Um, so we need probably uh, implement some better data structure for that. Okay, in practice, this is some example. What what are the options, uh, and what uh, is the default value for them? Uh, you can of course use a dash dash help to to display all of them. Uh, so the first uh, uh, the Basic issues that could be detected with uh, with uh, PMM check is, of course, this detection whether the you know the sequence of operations was correct. So whether there was the you did the store, whether you flash the data to persistence. Uh, the second issue is when you store the data, you don't flash, and you store the data to the same location. Probably it's not uh, not correct. If you store exactly the same value to the same location, it could be correct. So we provided uh, the option to, to, let's say, make it less restrictive. And uh, actually, this is for, for on purpose, because we detected that, we observed that the, um, I believe, memcopy or memset function does the, exactly, you know, the, the situation was observed that it does the store, if the data is not well aligned, like the beginning of the end of the buffer, then actually some bytes could be written twice. Uh, this is because of the internal implementation of those functions, and uh, you know. But of course, it stores exactly the same value to the same location. So we are uh, allowed to do that. So the PMM check would treat it as a. If you enable this option, it would treat it as a as a legal uh, operation. Uh, and of course, it de also able to detect uh, double flashes or unnecessary flashes and so on. Um, we support some. Uh, uh, it provides some, port, some support for transactions, so this would be, uh, I would talk about it in details on the next slides. Uh, yeah, so here is some example how, how it 
what is the output of PMM check if you if you run it with uh, some basic arguments and you have a store to uh, to this variable, but there is no flush, and when the program terminates, the output would be like that. So you have a store that was not made persistent properly. Another example, you have a double store to the same location without the flush in between. So again, overwritten store. Uh, here is the example of some unnecessary flushes. So uh, in here we, of course, this is the example of some pseudocode of, of, uh, from x86. So we have this CL flush opt built in. And uh, we do the flushing the same cache line twice. So this would be detected. And also this one is not necessary because there was no store to this location. So here we have uh, also the report for that. Uh, transactions. So uh, usually if you want to, to make sure that your data is stored in some atomic way, like you do some multiple modifications, like adding the new element to the list or something, you need to allocate the memory, fill it with data and put it into the list. So you need to modify some pointers or whatever links to, to adjacent elements. So you would like to uh, happen that you know all or nothing is executed, and uh, if the operations is torn, you can roll back to the old state. So for that, as you know, uh, you could uh, um, it was you know presented on the previous talks. Uh, we use some in libpymemouch. We use some underlock. So we take a snapshot of all the modif all the objects that would be that are going to be modified within the transaction. And if it's for some reason the transaction fails, you can restore the data from, from that. So if you write your program in that way, you are using the transactions, then you should some, you know, explicitly uh, inform the tool that you are starting the transaction. And if you do some changes to the persistent memory before that, that would be assumed like out of transaction changes, and this is usually a problem. Uh, it indicates some error in, 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 in your software. Uh, also, even when you start the transaction, you need to inform the tool that I'm going to modify this object, this region of memory. So, uh, and this also indicates that, okay, I'm taking the snapshot of this block of memory, so now I'm going to modify it. And this would be uh, that the PMM check would know that this is legal. You know what you're doing, right? So some simple example. We have a, you know, we have a object A. We started the transaction, and it's, it was added to this transaction. So the tool, PMM check, knows that object A, actually, what is the object A? It's just a block of memory, like pointer and length. Uh, it's going to be modified. So. We, it assumes that you have a snapshot of this. And we have also the other object uh, that is modified, but it was not added to the transaction explicitly. So it means that probably the snapshot of this object was not saved anywhere. So uh, if something wrong happens and the transaction is aborted, then the old content of this could be restored, but not for this object. So this is a bug. And PMM check would report that issue. Uh, yeah, here we have some examples of that. Like we start in the transactions, we are adding the, uh, this uh, piece of memory. We are registering, it. we are going to modify it, and we do. And we also do the modification of some other location that was not explicitly added to the transaction. And the PMM checked reports that uh, there was some, some stores made out of transaction. Another problem is when you try to modify the same object from two different transactions. And the problem is that in the first and in the second transaction, you would take a snapshot of this object, right? This is how the under locks work. And this is not bad because, you know, you may want to modify different parts of the same object. But what happens when one of those transactions commits 
let's say, in one thread, and in the second thread, it aborts. So in the second thread, the, the one that aborts, the, the, old, the old content of this object would be restored. So actually overwriting the changes made by, by, uh, by this one. So this is, again, probably not what you expect. And this is an example of how it would work uh, uh, in your program. So if you do the, all those instrumentations correctly, that would be detected by the by PMM check. And of course, the last one is the leftover transaction. So you started, you did some modifications, but we, you never commit. So probably a bug. Uh, yeah, we also support transaction nesting. So, so this is because in libpmm opt we do that. So also the tool should be aware of that. So like in practice, in, in, uh, in libpmm opt, the transactions are flattened. So if you start a nested transaction, it's actually uh, all the changes are re uh, applies to the outermost transactions. So, so actually you have just one. Um, yeah. And the last one, oh, maybe uh, yet another uh, information about those transactions. Uh, in PMM opt, we decided that uh, we support only one transaction per thread. So when we, when we did the instrumentation, the, each transaction in PMM check has its own ID. And in case of PMM opt, we just pass the thread ID as a transaction ID. Uh, but we can imagine that somebody would implement their own libraries, their own implementation of transactions, and uh, they would allow, you know, uh, they would like to have their the own uh, IDs. So, so our macros uh, also support that. So you can specify your own transaction IDs to, uh, to PMM check. And the last nice feature we have, which is actually in some sort of prototype uh, phase, it's implemented but not yet publicly available. Uh, but you know, this, uh, I mean the, the full feature, but some support in PMM check is already available. This is uh, logging. So um, as I said, to detect the problems with flash reordering, this is hard to, to detect it in runtime. When you stop your program and you examine the, the memory, probably you would see the, the correct values. Also, if you terminate, like kill your program, the, the system would, would do some cleanup and all the stores would be flushed anyway. So you can't observe the problem like missing flashes or reorder flashes and stuff like that. Uh, so to simulate that, um, we implemented the feature like, you know, that allows you to lock all the stores and all these, you know, flashes, operations in the in the some sort of uh, text file or binary file, and then you can use some another tool to do some offline analysis, and you can then take this log and simulate the execution. So every time you have a number of stores and you f uh, there there is a fence instruction detected, uh, the execution stops. And then it tries to simulate all the combinations that could happen in case of a real failure. So in this case, we have three stores. And in practice, if the program is, uh, you know, crashes here or there is a power failure at this moment, we can observe all those effects like, like this. So it could be like all the stores uh, were successfully flushed uh, or none, which are actually the... Uh, happy <laughs> scenarios, but those are probably not. So we can simulate that, you know, do all those permutations, and for each of them, you can specify the program or function that should be executed to check the consistency of the data. Because PMM check does not know nothing about what is what are your data, data structures and what what actually is stored here and what is here. What is the meaning of those? you know, variables, memory locations. So the PMM check is not able to analyze whether it's correct or not. Perhaps it's not, perhaps it's not. Perhaps it, it is, perhaps it's not. So, so we need to provide some external uh, tool. So you, when you write your program, you need to provide the, the tool that would 
do this uh, consistently checking. And we have uh, some sort of Python scripts that would do this uh, post-processing, right? All right, so here is how you can uh, take the log from the execution of your program. And later, this is the output, so later you can take this and run through these scripts to, to check whether there, is no, no, there are no issues in, in your code. All right, so that's basically it. Here are some links to, to our repos. So recently, originally we have just one repo, Valgrind. Uh, currently we have splitted this into two, so everything is under github.com slash pmem. Uh, so this, is ref this reflects how the, the original source code of, of Valgrind is actually organized. Um, here we have some links to the, to the tutorials in our blog on pmem.io, so, so you can, you know, some, some examples how to use it. So uh, perhaps some of those are the same as in this presentation. Uh, of course, this is the, the original uh, um, homepage of, of Valgrind project. Uh, yes, so... Uh, yeah, we, I'm running out of time, so the, maybe the last slide, this is the, actually the last slide, is about the future work. And um, so, as I said, the post-processing is in some prototype phase, so we need to complete this work and make it public. And uh, actually, this, currently it's a separate repo, but uh, I believe it should be a part of, of this Valgrind repo together with PMM check. Uh, so, Currently, it, we, it's still our, uh, you know, PMM checks still expect that, that you do the uh, memory controller drains uh, because it was written, uh, you know, with uh, uh, when the PMM, P commit was still required. Uh, so currently in NVML, we don't have P commit. This, 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 you know, there is no op actually, but we still call this uh, client request macro to inform the tool that we did the, the memory control buffer flashing, so, uh, so it works, but we need to make it uh, optional, so, and by default, uh, it should not expect any, any other uh, actions like cache flashing. Uh, also, the ordering, uh, I mentioned that CL flash opt, CLWB, they require the memory fence, but uh, there are also some other instructions that would order the execution of CL flash opt, CLWB, like X uh, change and log prefix instructions, so we don't support it yet. We, we have to add it. Um, performance tuning, as I said, in some scenarios the, the performance is terrible, uh, so we need, to, we need to fix it. Other architectures, if anybody would need it, if anybody would, let's say, port NVML to other architectures, we Recently, yesterday, we, we had a, a question uh, on our uh, um, mailing uh, list that somebody is trying to port it to PowerPC. So maybe uh, also the PMM check would support that at some point. And it would be nice to eventually upstream all of this work to, to the official Vargrind repo. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. I'm sorry, could, could you use the mic? Hey. Uh, the other day there was a talk about Clang and something called Lib Sanitizer, where, 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 you, where you link with a different library and uh, then it's, it's much faster, uh, like, like an alternative to, to Valgrind. Uh, I don't know if you if you heard about that or if, if that would be another approach that might make sense. So you mean the address sanitizer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we are using this for testing, but I'm not sure. Yeah, well, in case of persistent memory, whether it should could help oh, or yeah. not. But may, maybe this is one of the options. Yeah. So. No, it's just just another approach than using Velcrind. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, so thank you, and here are some links to maybe some more information. 
if you would like to, to check out, uh, of course. Uh, and also, I would like to encourage you, if you are staying here for, for the next day, tomorrow we have an NVML programming workshop. So, so if you like, please join us tomorrow. Thank you very much.